Hello everyone, my name is Victor Rodriguez and today I'm going to be presenting Innovating with Tool Change in 2023. What are the tool chains in the first place? Well, the tool chain is a very interesting topic that I really enjoy talking about. The tool chains are a set of tools that are going to be used for the developers to transform a basic source code into an executable machine language program. And the code that actually we develop as developer, it's necessary to be transformed through those all these set of tools. Imagine the tools as in the picture, like we have a hammer, we have a screwdriver, we have all the things that we need to create from a set of materials into a new robot, a new furniture, a new electronic device, so on. The tool chains are also responsible for taking source code and transform it into the proper executable machine language program. Now, the first part that we will see is that it's the, the presentation is going to be talking about what are the new features that the GNU tool chains provide in the latest 2023. There is a bunch of exciting features that we're going to be talking about that in today's presentation. But before we start, the first topic that we're going to talk, uh, part that we're going to be talking is the compiler. The compiler is going to be responsible uh, for transforming the C, pro the C code into an assembly program. The compiler is going to be responsible for checking if there are some errors in our source code. For example, lexical errors, syntax errors, semantic errors. But not only that, after that, if we desire, and there has been some previous blogs, presentation of Linux Com that has been um, very interesting about what kind of optimization we have in the compiler. In previous years, we have been talking about uh, looper rolling, about a loop interchange, about the uh, parts of the codes that are never reached or used if the compiler is able to detect the vectorization of using new instructions for specific new hardware features. It's, it's, it's a bunch of things. Now, that's the job of the compiler. In the end, it will generate a set of, of instructions that are in the assembly program through the desk that the assembler is going to take and transform that into object machine language model, right? The food that all. But that's not the only thing. Also, the, the linker is going to be taking and uh, do the union of the libraries with, with in machine language model to the lead to, to, to the specific new food that we have. Now, that is going to generate an assembly that out. That, that's the regular name that we have in A that out. We didn't specify it's very, very funny, very interesting. It's a that out. Somebody asked, hey, why a it's a that out? It's because it's a sample that out. That's the reason I'm coming out from that. Yeah. The executable machine language program, now it's ready for the loader to be taken and put it into work as a process. Now it's the job of the kernel. Now it's the job of the operating system to that part of say, I'm going to transform an executable into process. And way much better presentation about memory management and scheduler outside of this talk. Now, the first exciting new feature that it has been added into this um, latest version of tool chains is the addition of one interesting system called that was implemented in the kernel a few years ago, a few releases ago. It's the release the memory of the dying process. Now, better memory management of application has been an interesting topic forever, right? And that is something that we cannot ignore. Now, one of those fundamentals in variants of computing is that regardless of how much memory it's installed in the system, it's never enough. And this is not my words. This is the words by Jonathan Corbett in a, in a very interesting blog about this, this feature published in 2021. Now, killing a process must be very simple, right? Say, hey, I'm going to kill, uh, I'm going to kill this process and the memory must be released immediately right away. Well, in the real world, that doesn't work that beautiful, that, that straightforward. Um, however, we must know that hiding and, and trying to optimize the use of memory, it's important for all kinds of systems. If it's a small or a big one, if it's an embedded system or a big, super high performance computing system, all of them require proper use of the memory and be very, very, very optimized for the use of memory. That's for sure. Um, freeing the resources for the users by killing the process is doesn't work very quickly as expected. In this basic, very basic um, 
a representation or a simulation of a, of a graph. What I'm trying to say is like, imagine that you have a set of memory and in a specific time, you said, I'm gonna kill this process. Well, it doesn't free the memory just right away, straight forward in that specific microsecond. There is a ramp down of, of, of freeing up the memory. Well, that is um, the specific ramp down that we as developers, we are assuming that it's needed, but it's not. Now, the kill process by itself is responsible for cleaning up and freeing it resources, something very interesting to know. Um, however, the killing process finds itself blocked if an uninterruptible sleep. That cleanup work could be delayed forever. There are other factors that can slow down the freeing up of memory, including how busy is the relevant CPU and entire system, for example, super busy, might not have time for going up and cleaning just like right away. They are trying to do some other high important tasks just saying. Uh, also, if the CPU is running a slow or in low power state, it could, could also um, affect the speed of, 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 of the cleaning up of the memory. The GLBC recently, in the latest version, has added the proper new uh, system call for processing release. The processor release function has been added to the release of memory of a dying process using the color CPU affinity. And priority with the CPU usage encoded to the color. And the taxonomy of this, and here is the, the blog that uh, Jonathan Cobble provided about process and release. It's very fascinating. And here it's it's an example that I would like to put, to talk about it into, into this part, which is what are we going, how, how can we do the test? And this is a test already part of the GCC, uh, GLIPC trunk master. Actually, it's very interesting, but they do it's create a fork. And if you're in a child process, of course, the sub process is going to call the sub process function. The sub process function is going to create a timer. And after that ex um, expedition of the timer, it's going to kill the process by itself. Now, in that killing of a process by itself, we already have the process ID of, 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 of the process that was created as a child. Now, we will say, hey, I'm going to try to use a new system call to free up that memory in that specific form. It's a basic test, but it's very useful to illustrate how this would work. The other new um, uh, recently added system call is GLIPC process M advice. Process M advice system call is using to give an, an advice or direction to the kernel about the address ranges of another process or the common process. The goal of such advice is improve system or application performance, very useful. Let's see, uh, there is also a very interesting article in Elder Day about process and release. And let's talk about what are the risk taxonomy here in this specific part of GLFC in GitHub. You can find in a specific test case for process and advice that the developers of GLFC added and they added support for these new features. Now, let's see the taxonomy of how do you provide advice. The first thing that we will see is that it has the process ID of the process to whom you're gonna give the advice. The second thing is the pointer IOBEC points to an array of IOBEC structures defined in this .h file. It will provide, or you can specify the starting address and the length of the region. The IOBEC struct describes address range beginning at the base and also at the length you want to provide. It's specifying the specific region where you want to provide the, the, the or the specific um, region where to describe the address range. After that, the next thing that we can specify is the VLAN, which is specify the number of elements in the IOBEC struct. This value must be less or equal to IOB max, right? Um, the advice, how do I provide the advice? Well, the advice argument is one of the two following values, either, either full or page out. The Move the, 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 the M advice call actually deactivate a given range of pages. This will make the pages a more probable reclaim target. And this is a non destructive operation. The advice might be ignored, if so, of course, if some pages in the range are not applicable. The, on the other side, the page out, instead of deactivates, it reclaims a given range of pages. This is done to free up memory occupied by, the, by these pages. 
If a page is anonymous, it will be swap it out. If a page is filed, pack it and dirty, it will be written back to the backing storage. And the device might be ignored, of course, if some pages in the range when it's not applicable. And the device, the device might be applied only a part of the IABEC if one of the elements points to an invalid memory region of the wrong process. No further elements will be processed beyond that. That's, that's very interesting, very important. Uh, on success, the process and advice return the number of bytes advice. This return value may be less than the total number of requested bytes. If an error occurred after the IFEC elements, we already precise the color and should check the return value. Of course, minus one is, is the one that we provide. Here is another example for the test of process and advice into GLFC uh, open source project in GitHub. Another interesting feature is power capability tunables or power caps in GNU C library. And I like this picture because we have a set of different kinds of elements. It's, it's pretty much the same thing. It's a clipboard, but with different kind, with different colors. Imagine the same in this situation. Every year, hardware vendors provide new hardware features for the incoming CPUs, either micro architecture or new accelerators that could be used to new structures. Now imagine this situation. You have a system with a old version of the architecture that in that moment has a new specific instruction that was very, very, very useful. But a few years later, we have a way much better version of that same instruction with better accelerator, with new registers, new shiny microarchitecture that improves even way much more. Now we have two instructions of architecture, one released five years ago, we'd say it, and another one released this year, both from the same family. Now, a few years ago, our software team worked very hard to optimize the library for that specific architecture. Now we have to optimize the library for that new ISA. But wait a minute. We might have some users with the previous version of the hardware and some other users that are going to be getting the new instructions and architecture in the latest CPUs. How can we, as software developers, how can we, as operating system distributions, can work to provide both of them in a transparent way that they, the, the developers and the users, especially, don't care about that and will be transparent? Well, this is possible with hardware capability tuners or hardware caps in the GLC. Recently, more and more um, distribution has been cost, has been added the elegant solution for x86-64 version support. And it, this is thanks to the dynamic linker. The dynamic linker is going to be loading optimized implementation of the share objects from a subdirectory sub called GLC hardware caps. And on that library, it, it, this, this directory is going to be part of the library search path. And it will check under what platform I am located. And based on that, the linker is going to be the dynamic link of those specific optimized libraries when needed. So let's say that you have now the old version of the hardware. You will have in under our GLIPC hardware caps directory located in the specific subdirectories. The subdirectories are called x86-64 version 4, version 3, and version 4. So in, in these priority order. Now, it's going to go and try to search, hey, I'm located into this specific platform. Do you have something for this specific platform under this directory that I could use for dynamic linking? Yes, I do. Okay, so I'm going to do the link for that. The initial support directories that you might be seeing, it's version two, three, and four for x86. Now, there is a previous presentation that we did in LinuxCon 2017 about the born of this idea many years ago, as you can see, six years ago. Uh, the implementation was different, but the idea was exactly the same. And there are some specific subdirectories leave the optimized compiler 
for that specific architecture and optimize with, with that new instruction, put those libraries that the dynamic linker is going to use in those specific directories. The idea still works in the, in the latest version of, of GLFC. Um, now, the the, the, mesh, the, the the backbone of this is, is the logic that it's followed. This new feature in Glipsy enables libraries to use new CPU features. And the library will substantially be faster than to the specific new ISA, new specific accelerator. And the developer provide different version of the library. It's just to provide different version of the library into and put them into specific directories. One that it's used a new feature that it's super fast, one that it's used the previous feature it might be a little bit slow compared to the new hardware, but hey, if somebody does not have the new hardware, they it can still work. And the best part of it is that it's completely automatic. The only job that the developer has to do is to provide the specific version of the compiled libraries or the optimization in the proper subdirectories for x86. GLFC will automatically do the appropriate libraries, uh, load the appropriate libraries, do the linking, dynamic linking that match the version required for a specific hardware that you have. Um, and you don't need to hear. Example, let's make a big example. You can take the cleanliness, Docker pool, Docker pool cleanliness, and inside you will see that in user lib64 glibc hardware caps, you will see version three and version four. It's straightforward. You can repeat the same experiment. Now, I've been made a very, 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 very basic uh, code that actually do a operation of two arrays, adding two arrays many times. And that it's a very basic and simple stress test for this. It's going to be calling some specific maths part of the GLFC. Perfect. When we do an S trace of that, we will be able to see that, hey, wait a minute. It's doing actually the call for open, the system call for open bar for open V and and, and open at user lib64 GLIPC hardware caps 86 version 3 of libc.6. Libc.so.6. Hey, that's interesting. So it's going to be reading the glibc that is under Power Caps version three of x86. When we do an object dump, object dump of that specific binary, we will be able to see the binary. It's optimized because the client simplified to do it. Optimized for uh, the CDMM registers. And the CDMM registers, you have really seen in our presentation, it has uh, 512 bit length uh, register. It's, it's, it's very, very, very large register. And it's going to be available for ABA 512 instruction sets, like, for example, the Skylake that I was using for doing this experiment. Now, Another feature that is very, very interesting is GCC in GCC 13, its improvement to leap stdc++. And we're going to put libs stdc++ under die this here uh, for the sake of everyone. What is lib stdc++? It's a standard C++ library. It is needed to use most of the things that we have in, in compiled C++ code. Even the simplest hello word that you can find everywhere. Your first C++ project. Include iostream, int main, std c out, hello world, and return c. But what actually it's include iostream in C++? iostream stands for standard input out of the string. And the uh, iostream declares objects that control reading from and writing to the standard streams. In other words, the iostream library is the object oriented library that provides input and output functionality using the stream. But it's in a stream, and a stream is a sequence of bytes. You can think of it as an abstraction representation of a device, like the terminal or the keyboard and so on. You can perform I operation to the device by this abstraction. And you must include IO stream header to, to do the proper interaction with this kind of um, uh, devices, like writing to the screen. Now, one of the many enhancements that we have for GCC 13, and it's very well described in the blog from Patrick Pal Palka, um, a, 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 a linear IO stream in libstv C++ for GCC 13, is that it's going to put it under diet. In current version, in, in, the, in the latest version, GCC 12, including IO stream, um, 
there is a problem because the translation unit, the TU, introduces a global constructor into the compiled object file, into the result of the compiler that we saw at the beginning of the presentation, the, the, the dot .o file. One that is responsible for initializing the starter string object and also for program startup. On contrast, in GC13, this will not be that case anymore. We will move the initialization of the standard string object into the shared library that is for available for everyone. The benefit, of course, is the reduced executable size, improved linker times, and improved startup times in C++ program that makes heavy use of I stream. Now, using the compiler explorer, you will see here that, hey, when I have a very basic full of work, I can go over here uh, using the master, and you can see it's a very tiny amount of assembly result after the compilation. When you use the latest release, GCC 12.2, it has way much more because it has all the standard string objects initialization and program setup that will be moved to the shore line. What about x86 new ice and gcc That's going to be super interesting. Every year, if the hardware vendor provides new construction, uh, the GCC team works in collaboration with them to enable those new instructions into the compilers so us developers can take advantage of those new instructions and being impossible to implement them in our application. This year, GCC 13 is going to have, in terms of x86, I'm going to be focusing on for x86, it's going to have new implementation for Raptor Lake, Meteor Lake, Zero Force, Granite Rapids, and Grand Ridge. This presentation not have all the scope complete. Might have all, we will describe only for Granite Rapids and Sierra Force. Now, Granite Rapids is the evolution of Sapphire Rapids that was present to the release. Now, Granite Rapids, however, it's going to be coming later. Um, the interesting part about this new specific instruction is the AMX 12.16 was added. For Zero Forest and other ones like ABX, IFMA was added, ABX, uh, BNNI, in A was added, ABX and Econvert was added, and also CMP, CX, F was added. What about, let's gonna go with Granite Rapid. Granite Rapid, it's a dot product of floating point 16, not be floating point 16 styles of military in packet single precision. Now, in previous presentation, we talked about what is a tile and what is AMX, just as a summary. A tile is a two-dimensional array. Yes, it's a very fascinating two-dimensional array instead of a traditional one-dimensional array that we have previously seen like XMM, YMM, CDMM. Yes, they change from being 128 bits, 256 bits, 512 bits. No, the tiles, it's a two-dimensional array. In the presentation that I put this link over here, I described more about the microarchitecture of the tiles and the new instructions, which in this case is the AMX. And AMX has a bunch of new instructions for doing uh, our interesting operation for matrix. And one of those, of course, is the matrix multiplication of the dot product. Now, in recently GCC 13, we're going to be adding a new instruction for incoming Granite Rapid, which is do a matrix multiplication of floating point 16 elements from a tile to and tile three and accumulate the package single precision mill the result into tile one. Now that's fantastic if we could in assembly, but we don't do that for, for the application perspective, some of them, but what if I want to code in C? Well, for that, we have something called intrinsics. The intrinsics, it's very simple to use. Um, it will do include intrinsics that H and then IMM3 dot H. And then you can use the specific function. For example, underscore tile underscore DPFP16PS. And you pass the destination, you pass the tile A, and you pass the tile B. Of course, there is a specific instruction for moving from memory into tiles and from tiles into memory so that you can have access to those. Um, now, how can we test this? There is a very interesting example already in Mastertron for GCC when they added the support for these. 
It was requested, of course, to validate that actually it works and it's possible to explain that for us as developers. How do you use it? Well, here in the example is very interesting because they load exactly the same values into uh, tiles and then they create an on-calculate matrix function that we will return as in a result and also use at the same time the new instruction that is going to be available in Grand Rapid and then the result must be the same, must match in specific. If it doesn't match, of course, there is an error, but that's the way how it is tested. Now let's move to zero force. Zero force is going to be very interesting because it will have new set of instructions. And one of those is going to be VPM at 52 LUQ, L for low or there's also another version for high. What it's going to do, it's a packet multiply from sigma 52 bits integers, and nab them into 52, uh, the low part of 52 bits products of Q words simulator. Now, where is the application of these one? In the previous, it was very straightforward to think about an application of a dot product of floating point 16 power tiles matched multiplication uh, in high performance computing, weather forecast, you, you name it, right? It is very straightforward. Well, this one is kind of instruction is very useful for cryptography. And um, there are other presentations in, in, the, in, in other topics, they describe probably the use of this instruction. There are good papers about and I should leave the use of this instruction into the cryptography, how to take advantage of that. Now, the, the good news is that it's going to be available from the intrinsic perspective into GCC 13, right? The, the, the interesting part is that now we as C uh, developers can take advantage of that new instruction. How? Well, using this intrinsic, it's going to be MM256, there is version for 128, um, that it's going to be doing this operation, which is multiply the packet single 52 bits integers um, and then form, um, do, do the take the low part or the high part, the 52 bits of the result of that product. Now, there is also an example over here, uh, it's already in Master Trunk. The example is going to take actually destination, the source and source, source one, source two. And as a destination compared to the destination, it's actually the same as the one created for the calculation function that, that the GCC team created to validate the result that. What about ABX BNNI into A? It's very interesting. Um, Sierra Forest is well known that it will not have support for ABX Merkel. However, it will still have support for specific instructions like BNNI for precision in A that are very, very useful for machine learning. Now, what is the core of this thing? Well, as we have seen in previous presentation about BNNI we did years ago, also in Stone, it was uh, it, it, the, the, the idea or the core machine behind uh, BNNI is to emulate the same instruction or operation that the uh, neural network, convolutional neural network uh, algorithm performs. And it does actually perform the same, the same instruction, but the same operation, but in a single new instruction. It will multiply and add and say it's same by the, uh, with or without saturation. And, and, and it has, it, it, is a, it, it is a very interesting instruction because we have multiple um, version of that. We could have do the multiply and add with sign and sign, on sign and sign, sign and sign, and then in the end could be saturated or not saturated. Um, it will multiply, and here is the it's but here is the description of why it's not just simple BFM app. It will multiply the group of four pairs of signet bytes in one register that we can define, corresponding signet bytes of another register to the multiplication of those four groups, summing those into and adding. Uh, into the result of X M L one. When we use it in C, we will say that it multiplied groups of four package uh, adjacent pairs sign it eight bit integers in A with the ones that define it in B. It will produce four intermediate signal sixteen bit result. It will sum these fours with the corresponding thirty two bits integers defined in W that it's over here. So it has three inputs, A, B, and W, right? And when we compare, so we we'll explain it, they compare that logic of how does it work with the convolutional um, 
neural network um, algorithm, you will see that in the end, it's necessary to the result of the kernels to apply that that um, that um, final operation. There is a nice example also over in master trunk PCC that do the calculation by itself and also compare the results to um, using the instruction. Uh, the next one is AVX and E convert. This instruction is going to load the B floating point 16, and interesting, and convert them into floating points 32 elements with growth. Now, it's a simple translator. It will take the B floating point 16 elements and convert to floating point 32. This is for compatibility, and it's going to be also available in CR cores. There is a nice example, very smart, that what they do is convert from floating point 32 to be floating point 16, and then ask to the new instruction, please transform be floating point 16 into floating point 32, and the result of both operations must match, giving the same specific number. Uh, the last one, it's going to be CMPX, CMPCCX app. It's, it's, it not just, it's not just one instruction, it's a bunch of instructions that we could have uh, um, surrounded by, uh, being encapsulated into a single one. It will compare an app if condition is met. Multiple conditions could be met. Here's the thing. For example, see compare value, and if it's below or equal, add the value from 32. And then we have, and this is when you're doing compare below or equal x at. Then we could have compare below x at, which is going to do a compare um, the values in, in the first operand with the sec second operand. If it's below, add the value below, but not equal from R2, the third, the third operand to M3, 32, and write a new value in M32. So, and, and I just put a, a small set of those. You can find more in the X86 um, Intel Software Development Manual, where you will find all the possibilities that you could have the different kind of conditions. And there is, of course, a very good example in GCC Master Branch that you could use as a reference for coding. How can developers play with these new toolchains? That's that's interesting. Worlds from, from from developers' perspective, there are many distros available over here. I put the link uh, that it's that with, with a summary of multiple blogs and then talks about how to use the latest GCC thirteen or latest Linux um, two point thirty seven that are available in distros and including the open source project for Linux, which is very simple to do Docker pull with Linux and you will have the latest and greatest version of the tool chain. Now, having a better understanding of this innovation, it's basic and it's fascinating because you can think about new things you can develop on your source code. You can improve the performance, you can improve the security, you can improve the size as we have seen that are on another presentation we have been talking about analyzer that helps you to create much more secure code, much more clean code. You have seen how to use new accelerator that without that capability will be very frustrating because you will have a piece of hardware that has a new, shiny, amazing new instruction, but you cannot use it because the tool chains does not provide you to create actually a connection between your source code and the use of that new instruction. With a very basic new flag that you just need to add to the compiler, you'll boom, immediately transform and generate a new version of the, of, of the executable now with the use of that accelerator. Now we have seen in this presentation how they put into die the very basic library in moving or translating the work of initialization from the object um, file into the shared library. And that will improve the size of the binary very much and also the performance. It's going to be fascinating. Well, thank you so much for this time. I hope that you have enjoyed the presentation. Uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask me. Thank you so much, and thanks for letting me speak at the Open Source Summit North America. Thank you. Have a great day.